Hi, welcome to Infusion, the podcast. I'm comedian Chris Patrick, self-acclaimed power man, and I'm here with my co-host, and my other Rach. Hey, guys. Now, today we're talking about something that's very dear to me, uh, history. I love history, American history, uh, African-American history, but I just love history. And today we're talking about some stuff that happened in history, again, that's not talked about. Now, we just celebrated, or not celebrated, but we just started to recognize uh, the Tulsa massacre back in 1921. But what you don't know is that there was a lot of... um, Other things that happened before that, there was a string of riots that happened before the Tulsa massacre in uh, 1921. We're talking about the Red Summer. So, Rach, what can you tell us about the Red Summer? So, it actually happened in 1919. 1919, okay. So, what happened before that was in St. Louis, um, the NAACP started becoming um, a thing, and they did a silent march in St. Louis in July of 1917. Okay, 1970. Now, wasn't there something that these soldiers that came back from uh, World War One? That was in 1919. Yep. 1919. Okay. Now, these soldiers came back from the war in 1919, and what they found out is that overseas that they they were they were treated like, um, you know, not second class citizens, but they had they had rights and they were treated they were treated equally overseas, and they came back after fighting in the war, fighting for America, and they wanted equal equal treatment in america and they weren't getting the equal treatment in america after coming back from serving this country very true very true in fact there's a funny story to go along with that um for um african americans um we know about the stories about the buses yes yes um there was a very similar um thing going on with the trains um for the trains um if the passengers um seating was filled up the black passengers needed to get off and allowed the white passengers to get on okay okay and um this white um um officer seen that this black um officer had just gotten married and had waited two trains and said why aren't you getting on the train yeah, black, okay, a black black officer from the war. Right, right. Army army guy. Um said, "Why aren't you getting on the train?" And he said, "Well, the rule is if it's full, we need to get off." And he's like, "Well, you're not going to miss the next train." And he um the white officer pulled out his gun, went to the captain of the train uh, Pulled con- it out. The conductor, conductor. Conductor, yes. Conductor. The <laughs> conductor of the train said, this guy's going to get on this next train or your head's going to be blown off. <laughs> guess what it was? I guess he got on the train. He got on that train. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 that's the, and that's the thing thing with this, because also, too, this, this also um, sparked a string of riots, right? So this, pers- this instance did not start riots. Okay. Um, so let's actually get into the education so we could, um, educate everybody out there. What actually started all these horrible, terrific, like horrendous riots. Yeah. So what happened with these riots was, um, birth of a nation just came out. Okay. Birth of a nation. Birth of a nation, um, is a movie by, I think it's W E Du Bois. I think. No, no, no. Um, E.W. Griffith, I think E.W. Griffith wrote it, but I should know the director. I might have to look that up. Uh, but anyways, um, it's a very, very um, racist movie and predicts black people, um, white people in blackface and predicts black people very, very bad. And also, too, um, if you ever taken a film class, one of the things they say is watch Birth of a Nation cinematically. As far as advancements in cinema and stuff like that, it's very, very um, cinematically done. I mean, it's really, Back really... Back in the Times, one of the best. Yeah, one of the best. Cinematically, it's one of the best. Um, if you ever study film class, they would always, they'll always tell you, go back and watch Birth of a Nation. But the way it, the way it depicts black people and, the, and what happens in the movie is very, very racist that probably wouldn't get seen today. And in fact, um, it was actually seen in the White House and the KKK because of that reason thought of it as a love letter brought up, mm, brought to them from the white house yeah. because it was seen in the white house. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what's going on in that movie is a black face man 
rapes a white woman. Yeah. And this gives people an idea. Another thing that's going on during this time is the Green Book. The Green Book. The Green Book is something that was educating the black people how to start traveling safely. Okay. Um, the Green Book, and it, um, if a lot of you don't know what the Green Book is, the Green Book was a book um, that was towards um, the automobile. One of the things that brought the automobile was the superhighway. One of the things that brought the superhighway was that people started traveling, and black people were – and that too, we wanted to travel. So black people started traveling, but there were only certain places they could stay. I mean, we're t- certain place they could stay, certain place they could fill up if they wanted to get something fill to Fill up, shop, yeah. eat. And what they did is they produced this book called The Green Book, saying that these are this is um, African-American friendly, where black people could go, they could fill up here, they could fill up there, they, you know, don't go here, don't go here. And there was also some other things, too, like you can't travel at night and stuff like that. You know, No, actually, you had to travel at night. It yeah, was the had, most okay, okay. safest time to travel at night. Yeah. So there were certain rules at that time. You could not pass a white person driving. It was against the law. Um, so it was actually safer for people, black people to travel at night. Mm -hmm. Um, but the green book allowed it. And there was two other, there was two other books brought out at that time, but they weren't as safe as the green book. Yeah. Um, they would give like this, this place is relatively okay, but the green book wanted feedback if this place was not okay Mm -hmm. so that they could change it in their next publication. Yeah. Anyways, continuing now. And also too, this was before, um, before Facebook, before social media, before the internet, this is way years, years, years before this. So, um, there, um, going on, sorry guys. (laughs) Um, the green book allowed it so that you knew where you could fill up next. You knew where you could eat because you would generally travel 180 to 300 miles sometimes before you could fill up again. That means that you're traveling with gas cans and food with you wherever you're going in your next destination. Yeah. You were traveling with a story so that if you got pulled over, you could tell that officer your story so that you could safely make it to your destination. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this, and this, and this was a very, um, very bad time during, during American history. And also too, as far as, um, and from, from what I've read and from, there were places where, you know, you like had to like pull over for, um, women, women and men to, uh, relieve themselves. We, y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go into details, but there were things like that where you couldn't even stop and, you know, go to the bathroom. Absolutely not. Men were trained to ward off snakes and rodents so that the women could go into the field and relieve themselves. Yeah, well, I don't know about you, but if whoever woman I'm with, she's going to have to do that herself because I'm not warding off no snakes. I'm not a snake. <laughs> Chris, I'm afraid of snakes. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, would, you would have to hold it because the only way I'm going in there is with a gun. I see a snake is getting shot. Okay? <laughs> I'll give you the gun. Go down there and do what you got to do. Man. I ain't going near no snake. <laughs> I can definitely see you running in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Won't be here. You better go behind the car and grab a bucket or something because it ain't gonna be Chris you know? I'm like but, that Richard Pryor joke one time we we're in the woods my dad said somebody said snake my dad said pow, 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 man. that's me anyways you guys continuing um, it, no, um the green book allowed it so that we could um you African Americans could travel um the great thing about Tulsa Oklahoma was that it was known as Black Wall Street Black Wall Street <laughs> Um, and, and as we said on as we said on previous podcasts, um, there was we went um, Tanya's um, Tanya, 
Rachel's friend Tanya got married and she lives in Oklahoma City. And I said, if we're going to Oklahoma, we definitely, definitely got to go to Tulsa because I definitely want to see Black Wall Street. And we went down there. We took some pictures down there. And it was it was just really, really nice seeing Black Black Wall Street. And we got there real early in the morning. There was a church and we went inside the church and we said, yeah, we're just we're just tourists. We're just looking at, it, you know, because we read about it. And, it goes, oh, and the guy said, oh, yeah, come on in. We got some pictures up on the walls. You guys can look at it if you want to take pictures. We're going we're to have service. So if you want to stay for service, you know, and they were really nice. And it was really, really nice being down there. And it was really, really interesting and really a great part of history to see. And even though, um, well, everything's being taken up now so that they can find the bodies and start rebuilding that um, museum now. But okay. this is before we went before all that stuff yeah. started happening. Well, basically what happened is there was a lot of um, during this riot in 1921, um, there was a lot of uh, killings and there were so many graves that it wasn't just like and bombings and bombings that from the airplanes. Yes, from what I guess they, they had to do. They had to do a mask, a mask. A big mass mass burial, which is, again, sad, you know. And they were having problems. You know, you guys can watch on Hulu. There is actually a documentary done on Tulsa and the Red Summer. Yeah. That's where I got most of my education. Um, anyways, continuing. Um, and again, too, these are parts of history that ain't been talked about that are just starting to come to fruition to be talked about. Um, so we were actually in Tulsa before all that, um, bringing up, bringing up of, uh, the ground was happening and we could feel the heaviness. Yeah. Like we could feel the heaviness above the ground. We could feel the heaviness in our hearts. We could feel like we left very quiet people. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really, it was really moving to see and really, really sad to see, but also to really good to see. So, um, moving on. Um, so the green book allowed black people to travel safely through the United States. Um, one of the biggest places that everybody wanted to go to was Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, just building this all up in your guys' mind. Um, uh, birth and donation was created. Um, the reasons then in birth of a nation, um, that, um, was so powerful was a white woman in that movie was raped by a black man continuing. So you're traveling to a place where you're seeing black growth without any white people helping. Yeah. Without, without, any, without any outside influence. And white people are seeing this and they're like, how do we, how do we get, how do we squash this? How do we get rid of this? Because absolutely they need us because there's things out there that, you know, there's a doctor out there saying, well, their brains ain't any smarter than eight. You know, black men need to be castrated. Like these are ugly, horrendous things that are completely untrue and the NAACP and other groups are fighting at that time to prove untrue. Mm -hmm. The soldiers are coming back and they see that they can be treated as equals. And so they are done. Yeah. After they fought for the country. That's right. And they want their respect they want their honor because they fought for their country and they seen that they didn't need to be under segregation anymore. Which, which is, which, which just goes without saying, I mean, you know, you, you put your life on the line for, for a country and you come back and you're treated like a second class citizen. I mean, and that, that, that's with anybody. I mean, to me, that would be if, if you're, if you're black, white, Jewish, Catholic, you know, whatever, you know, you would want, you would, Hey, I fought for this country. This is, you know, I want, I want respect in my own country that I'm in, you know, um, going <laughs> like, um, shout out to fancy Ray. Um, people don't, a lot of people don't notice, but, um, everybody was talking about the, you know, kneeling for the flag and thing like with, um, Colin Kaepernick on the night of the 49ers. But, uh, what we don't know is that Jackie Robinson refused to stand for the flag. He, 
he would not because when he was coming back, who also served for our country in World War Two, he found that German prisoners were getting treated better than his own people were after they had fought for this country. Um, well, Jackie Robinson wasn't the first black major major league player. There was a guy by Walter Fleetwood, Walter Fleetwood Walker, who played for the Tupelo Black Blue Stockings. He was a catcher, and this was back in like 1885. But I think the first one was uh, William Edward William Edward Wee. Um, this is way before 1947. Then they they put a band on baseball as far as um, black people um, being in the major league. And then in 1947, okay, Jackie Robinson played his first game in the major league with the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. So moving into what happened in 1919, 26 cities catch on fire throughout our nation. Now, just picture this in your head. Kind of what happened during the uprising of George Floyd, but in reverse. Yeah. The KKK are involved. And at first, the soldiers are taking, protecting the African Americans. But in Knoxville, things change. In Knoxville, the mayor is protecting the black man that is accused of murdering a white woman. Because in Knoxville, lynching, which you guys, is still legal today. We have to stop that. We have to talk to our legislation. Legislators. Legislators. And say no more. Um, Lynching, if Trump didn't show us anything and showed us how far we haven't came. Yeah. Um, So lynching has to become illegal. And throughout uh, throughout the nation. Throughout the nation. And other stands need to change too. Moving on. In Knoxville, the mayor... Worked with the black people now to a point. He still didn't believe in all equality, but when lynchings happened, it happened, happened with the courts. So it wasn't, let's just go get this person and lynch them. So what the mayor did was he hid them, him in the prison And dressed him up like a woman and snuck him out. Well, then the white people came and searched the prison and they weren't happy with that. So they started to search the town. And the soldiers, black soldiers, were like, what's going on here? They started getting upset. So... They're over by the train station. Start, things start getting on, on, up, up, you know, really t- tense. And people start fighting. And um, it just gets way out of control. And the blacks are losing. And they go hide. And the soldiers come. White soldiers come. And they're thinking, oh, they're going to come and protect us. So they start coming out of hiding. And they start getting fired upon. This is the point where in 1919, soldiers are now changing from where the other cities that were on fire, where the soldiers were protecting them, are now fighting against them. This is where the change is happening so that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, two years later, you are seeing bombings from airplanes. Yeah. On your own people, on your own American citizens, even though, even even at the fact that they're black, you're bombing on American, your own American citizens. There's actually a woman in that documentary in Hulu that told her granddaughter 
Look out the window. Your nation is firing upon you. You see that flag out there? That means your nation is firing upon you. Yeah. And as something like that, and again, this is, this is stuff in history that is not talked about, is not, um, is not taught and stuff that should be uh, come out more in our, in our history because um, in our history, in, in our American history, there is some, some dark passes. There's some stuff that needs to be, that needs to be talked about and needs to be, um, needs to be addressed and it needs, it needs to come out um, in order to, in order to us, as we try to move forward as a people, as a nation. And that's, and that means all people. Um, so, um, another thing that happened was in Elaine, um, black croppers and Elaine, Elaine, Elaine. Yes. Um, I can put more of the details in our description exactly where Elaine is in our nation. Yeah. Um, the black croppers were unionizing. And they started uprising. The black crap. The black sharecroppers, because oh, the black croppers, croppers. yeah, th- I'm sorry, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> you gotta understand something. We're we're on episode sixteen, and if you guys are just starting to listen in, I have a tumor. Um, sometimes I have brain things, and that's why I'm so grateful for Chris. Um. He, he fills in my gaps, but sometimes he's just like, what in the world is she talking about? <laughs> so he fills in my gaps sometimes very, very well. Um, <laughs> moving on, you guys. The, the black sharecroppers. The okay. black sharecroppers. Go, go on, go on, go on. Yeah. So um, the black, um, the cotton, because of the war, was at great prices. They were using it for weapons. They were using it for clothing. Um, women's fashion was starting to move up. So cotton was extremely, extremely needed, wanted everything. So the black sharecroppers were unionizing and um, uprisings started happening because of that. Um, three days of fires and killings happened because of that. And 12 men, um, black men, were dragged away to prison. Um, Ida B. Wells, actually, um, after a couple of the men had been hanged, um, disguises herself and gets the stories for, for, from some of those men that are in prison. And she prints those stories in their true form. And it goes all the way to the Supreme Court where they are set free. So, and, I, and Ida B. Wells, I uh, explain who that was. She was an American author at that time that would um, fight for the true story of... Um, African Americans. Mm-hmm. So, um, another great paper at that time was, um, sorry guys, the Washington Bee. The Washington Bee. Um, the Washington Bee was printed by African Americans, and they would tell the true stories because there was tons and tons of papers that would print the. The white woman was raped in such and such a town, which would trigger the riots even harder. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that would happen is photographers at that time would have a printing shop close by Mm -hmm. so that they could make postcards of the cities Mm -hmm. that were being set on fire. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Um, Ida B. Wells said the way to write things is to turn the light on them. Mm -hmm. Patterns of these massacres lead all the way to Tulsa. 
Um, you guys, it's important to know the truth and it's important to know your history, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Chris come from generations where in our schools, they were not, they were taught a form of truth, but most of our truth that we found was in our own education. Yeah, and and that's and that's the thing with me. Um, <laughs> I think I've told this story before. I was in fifth grade, Fair Oaks Elementary, Brooklyn Park, <laughs> Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and um, my teacher told me she goes, "You got to go go to this room." And I'm like, "Go to this room for what?" And she's like, well, "We'll just go to this room." So she goes, "Let's go down there." And I went into the room, and the lady goes, "Hi, you know, it must be Chris." Her name was Mrs. Benson. And I walk into the room and it was basically a, a room to help me with my um, with my reading, with my writing, stuff like that. And she goes, I, I hear you're really into black history. I said, yeah. And she had all these books. And um, back then they used to have like these um, these comic book um, history, comic books and stuff like that. And I started reading this stuff and I was just like blown away. You know, that's when I first learned about Crispus Attucks, one of the first people to die for this country um, in uh, Boston. And I learned about uh, uh, George Washington Carver and what a lot of people don't under, don't know about George Washington Carver. Great, 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 um, very, very well-educated man. But what they don't know is that um, when George Washington, George Washington, George Washington Carver was um, adopted, are adopted by a white family. And he grew up with a white family and this white family had two daughters. So at a young age, they castrated him. So to keep him from being, getting with their daughters. And a lot of people didn't know this. And when he, when he went to Tuskegee, Alabama, when he went to the uh, Tuskegee college, everybody thought he was gay or cause he never, but they didn't know. And he didn't tell that, you know, he was castrated. And this is stuff that is not said in, um, in the history books. And sometimes, and this is with all types of history, you know, um, even in you know Amer- regular American history, like this, the story we've been told, George Washington chopped down the cherry tree. That that story never happened. I don't know where it came from or anything like that. But and this is things too. You know, you got to do your research and you got to you know seek seek your own history. But um, as far as getting back to subject, the Red Summer. So, what are some things that are uh, what are some YouTube videos and um, and what are some things they can look for? Rach, as far as uh, finding out more about this, if they want to read more and, and educate themselves themselves about this um you guys um so i will gladly um on our description print every single piece of article that i researched um you can definitely look up um where i did hulu for the tulsa and red summer um documentary you can look up um in audible um there is uh um a book that I will, um, like I said, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm really having a brain thing going on. Um, there is, um, a book that talks about, um, the, um, green book. And also there is another book that I'm currently reading about the red summer. And there is quite a few, um, YouTube videos that I directed Chris to on the Red Summer. Yeah, interesting and really, really interesting stuff. So, um, we would love to have other people on here talking about more adversity. We don't want to just talk about African American history. We don't want to talk about just LGBTQ. We would love to have Muslims on here. We would love to have Mexicans on here. We would love to be able to tell your guys' story also. Latinos, Latinos. <laughs> Latinos, yeah. um, Native Americans. Um, this isn't um, just... What I'm finding is um, for us is this is bringing together western and eastern health but look inside yourself and um your heart needs to be a whole too so diversity and unification needs to happen so we're going to wrap this up by me saying history is filled with lines of hate build lines of love 
and always be your best advocate. And happy 4th of July.